Madam President, thank you very much indeed, and indeed fellows and guests, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to say something about this site with which I have been preoccupied, my friends and family will say very much preoccupied with over the last uh, 15 years. Um, this is the place that I am going to talk about. I'm using a lot of slides that Toby Driver, Dr. Toby Driver, a fellow of the Society uh, of the Royal Commission in uh, Aberystwyth, uh, took, um, but I do feel in such splendid photographs that I'm actually acting as the tourist board for Central Wales uh, in trying to promote how beautiful this stunning landscape is uh, that all of this exists in. Strata Florida was a Cistercian Abbey that was founded first in 1164, and as I shall represent to you, effectively refounded in 1184 under the patronage of one of the great princes of Wales of the 12th century, if not the great prince of Wales in the 12th century, the Lord Rhys of uh, De Hebarth. Uh, it's a landscape which is draped over the Cambrian Mountains, if you know that part of the world, and spreads itself to the sea. So I was delighted when Toby um, uh, showed me some of these photographs which uh, were commissioned by our project and enabled me to show you uh, how extraordinary this landscape is. Everything in that picture that you see, the air photograph on the right hand side, was owned by Strata Florida. The abbey itself uh, is today a relatively modest monument. I don't know how many of you have been there. Uh, you can see from the air photograph on the left that it is, consists largely of the cruciform church, uh, the chapter house, and the northern part of the cloisters. To the north, it has a cemetery, uh, of which more and on, and to the south, uh, a collection of farm buildings, again, more of which uh, are on. One of the things I shall want to be talking about is what brings people to Strata Florida, and in the past, what brought people to Strata Florida. Uh, and I think fittingly, as I've displayed in the third slide on there, we have a ampulla uh, from the gatehouse of the abbey, which we have been extensively uh, excavating. Uh, and it's a nice symbol and token of some of the meaning that I want to talk about. I want to start with national identity, in part to explain something of the title. Um, National identity is a major consideration in today's devolved politics uh, in Wales. And if you were to create a list of the indicators of that identity in Wales, it is undoubtedly the language and the primary index of Welsh uh, identity. It is, as you will imagine, a hugely contested area. And no, I am not going to go into the politics of that identity uh, this evening. Uh, you might want to push me with questions a bit later on, but maybe not. Um, the uh, maps, the two maps, show the proportions of people in the 2001 and 2011 censuses uh, who said that they could speak uh, Welsh. There's a great deal of pride in this, but there's a great deal of threat. If I've been able to show you a map of uh, 1901 and 1911, you would have seen a great erosion of that capacity to speak the language. Protecting the language is a core political activity. Language, however, as we all know, is a reductive indicator. Welsh identity is and was much more complex and subtle and varied from region to region, with strong roots in history, with a myth of origin set in a dim Celtic past. When I went there 40 years ago, I think I had to learn the hard way that an important aspect of this is chapel culture, dissenting chapel culture, as an historic self-image and identity. And we have this lovely photograph of the congregation pouring out of Shiloh, Calvinist Methodist Chapel in Lampeter. What is that self-identity? God-faring, spiritual, ascetic, hard-working, family-based, communal, as well as politically, ethnically, and class-resistant. Uh, I could spend the whole lecture unpacking that last phrase, 
but I'm not going to. A key icon and artifact of that identity is the complete Bible translated into Welsh by William Morgan of Penmachno in 1588. The sacred word in Welsh became available to an increasingly Protestant culture, one which was to find its religious, cultural and political voice through dissent. Language and text are linked with a strong sense of the sacred lived-in meaning of place. It's a wonderful Welsh word for this. Avro, the neighbourhood, the district, the area. And as a landscape archaeologist, the district, the area, is very much where I begin in the way in which I operate in my methodologies. But in particular, I want to point to a word, hiraith, um, that some of you I will know. It is a word that means both longing and belonging, a yearning for place, but a sense of belonging to that place at the same time. And it doesn't matter where you have gone to, whether it's New York or Patagonia. My father, why, it's about why my father-in-law, Don Parry, a Welshman of long lineage and a deacon of his Baptist chapel, went just before his death to stand and pray in the ruins of the church of Strata, Florida, and next to the grave, he, as he is here, of the greatest medieval Welsh poet, David Ap Willem. And this lecture is an attempt in this way to understand that act of piety and his belonging to Wales. Why did he go? He's a gog. He is, he is a man from the north of Wales. He come to the south of Wales in order to carry out this act of piety before his death. Well, I want to begin uh, with history. I suspect some of the history of Wales is a little fuzzy to a lot of you. I'll try and bring a little clarity to it. But I'm going to have to drive a coach and horses through a very complicated story. The initial foundation, we know from Vatican document, was in 1164, uh, with a grant by Robert Fitzstephen, Lord of Penarth, uh, Knight of the Clare Lords of Ceredigion. The Clare family uh, had captured Ceredigion as marcher lords in the earlier parts of the 12th century and was still in their hands in 1164, suppressing the princedom of Ceredigion. I'm going to use a little series of maps now in which the, the little green panel, appropriate colour, is Wales, it's native Wales, those areas under, at any particular moment in these slides, under the protection of people who would class themselves as native princes. There's all sorts of issues about the word native in, 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 in that context. The abbey was founded as a daughter house of Whitland, shown as blue on the map there, which itself was an Anglo-Norman uh, foundation. However, uh, in uh, 1165, probably within about nine months of that initial grant, the Rhys of Griffith kicks the Clares out of Ceredigion. They never return. And he confirmed, one of his first acts was confirm the grant of lands to Strata Florida. And then actually, and this is the more important part of the story, he refounded it, I believe, in 1184. The annexation of Ceredigion doubled the size of the area in green, Rhys's lordship uh, of Dehebarth. It took me about 10 years to learn how to pronounce Dehebarth. And I still haven't got it right, have I? My, my lovely wife, who's a Welsh speaker, keeps uh, telling me I don't get it right. Now, Lord Rhys um, is, is an important figure in Welsh history. Uh, he reached an accommodation with the uh, energetic, troublesome, uh, and aggressive Henry II, at Newnham in 1171. The substance of that accommodation really was to allow Henry II to do all the other things that he was doing in the world, uh, whether it be in France, Aquitaine, uh, or eventually in Ireland. Um, he needed peace on his western flank, and he recognised in the Lord Free somebody he could do business with, and that famous phrase, remember, which came back from Moscow uh, many years ago. In a technical sense, in a legal sense, Rees was granted additional authority as fief of Henry II by being appointed Justiciar of the Southern Welsh Princes. English royal holdings like Cardigan and Carmarthen, where there were English royal castles, uh, and certain marcher lordships, particularly around uh, the fringes. Now, from 1171 to his death in 1197, 
We must regard Rhys really at the height of his powers. It's a narrow window of time, and Stratoflora sits right in the middle of that window. Uh, he had also an alliance with, um, it's rather hazy, and a certain hegemony over the princess of Gwyneth and Poes in the north. So you can extend the green that far in terms of uh, de Hebert's influence at this particular and important point of time. About this time, the notion and distinction between pure Awalia, pure Wales, native Wales, and uh, marcher Wales begins to emerge, the former uh, in green still, uh, and the latter remaining uh, in uh, uncolored terms. If you test that notion of national identity that I showed you at the beginning with the maps, and I've repeated the map here, uh, this is really, in a sense, the moment of the origin myth of the linguistic divide, which is simplifying Welsh, cult Welsh political culture, that is between the English English speakers and the Welsh as Welsh speakers. Legitimately, and here I would like to ask the question, was the ambition actually larger than that? Uh, I've called this aspiration by attack. I hope you can make out the green arrows at the bottom of the Lord Rees's area. He's clearly attacking into marcher lordships, some of which are not very old at all by this time. Uh, less than a century, and the, uh, well, certainly way less than uh, a century, maybe two generations, and he's beginning to take those on. In the year before his death, in 1196, uh, he even attacks De Vries, uh, in the great lordship uh, of Brecon, uh, there uh, to, directly to uh, his east. The question I would ask, uh, and I think implicit in my asking of the question is my opinion about this, is it possible to identify an ambition to create a Welsh state? Now, in Welsh historiography, this is a vital question. Anybody who knows anything about Welsh historiography will know that long has been addressed the issue as to whether there was a Welsh state before modern notions of a Welsh devolved state were created. In other words, is there an historic lineage to the notion of a Welsh state? That debate usually centres on a generation later, on Llewellyn Vaur, uh, the great prince of North Wales, of Gwyneth. So inside of what I'm going to present to you is the notion of that question. My answer to the question is yes, <laughs> obviously. Rhys died in 1197 and was buried at St David's, the justi justiciarship uh, ended, in fact it ended probably on Henry II's death and his sons effectively took De Hebarth apart. The curse of a Welsh prince is to have more than one son because part of all inheritance gives them the right in a sense to rip the entity apart and that is literally what happened. Welsh power then shifted, the hegemonic power shifted north into the hands of Llywelyn ap Iorwerth, uh, who whose years of re reign in Gwynedd were long, 1199, and hugely successful till 1240. It is an irony that the English took back their possessions, one of which was Cardigan Castle, precisely the place where Rhys performed the first event of Welsh identity, the nationalised Stedwod. Uh, that, and that was taken back, returned to the hands of the black. You will note that my base maps here are all those, if you know the work, of William Rhys. Um, he was doing this in, in just after the Second World War, and the enemy is always in black. Uh, and it goes back to the Daily Mail maps of the Nazi invasion of northern France. Okay? You always had to examine your source. I'm not going to go there either. <laughs> At the height of his powers, Trisap Griffith preeminently chose the Cistercian Order for his benefactions. In some sense, this is about, and Welsh historians would write this, the asceticism of the order, this bright, <coughs> brilliant, vibrant new order, which is overturning the corruptions of the Benedictines and the Cluniacs in, in, in particular. And asceticism, the return to the rule of Benedict, is the order of the day. This tunes in, in a sense, with this national identity, this chapel culture that I mentioned before of a kind of asceticism. 
but also politically? Was this to win support from and gain access to the international influence of the church as a counterpoise to the aggressive English state? Get the church on your side and you are one up, even on Henry II. More complexly, and again, I don't think we have time really to go into this, certainly not with Janet Burton here in the audience, is the normative story of Cistercian expansion and oversimplification, oversimplification uh, of the dynamic alliance between religious zeal and secular ambition at the local level. This is a very typical matter. That is actually taken from the guidebook to Strata Florida to show, again, almost lines of invasions of the Cistercians and how it is they managed to colonize and to populate at the British Isles. But the uncertainties of uh, all of this, I think, are uh, almost um, emblem emblematized, symbolized by the fact that we were very comfortable to begin with in this story that the origin came from Whitland via Clairvaux until very recently a history of the Abbey of Vaucelles, Cistercian House, just simply proclaimed they founded Strata Florida. So actually now, I'm not so sure as I used to be exactly how it came to be founded. So is this normative story of Cistercian expansion an oversimplification of the dynamic alliance at the local level between religious zeal and secular uh, ambition? Was there accommodation? And of course, in the case of Strata Florida, I'm going to argue that. And indeed, there's now a great deal of very fine international scholarship that recognizes this, and I, I noted that Terrell Kinder is going to be, uh, hopefully, become a fellow of this society, and her work, I think, is very important in, in, in all of that. More widely, the princes of native Wales chose the Cistercians of one lineage, of Whitland. All the Cistercian houses, the preeminent house of the Welsh princes, uh, preeminent order of the Welsh princes, uh, came from Whitland. And uh, the Anglo-Norman foundations of Cistercians, uh, I didn't put them in black, I put them in brown, are uh, uh, drawn uh, from other lineages. Now this is quite interesting in a sense. There's a, it suggests a strength of alliance, a strength of ideological intention uh, among uh, the uh, Welsh princes. Another point I would like to make, uh, particularly in relationship to Strata Florida, so earlier in the 12th century, in the end of the 11th century, beginning of the 12th century, the diocesan church in Wales was completely reformed. Now, this was a big act. It was an important act uh, because, really, this was about suppressing the so-called South Celtic church beforehand, the apostate church in the eyes uh, of uh, Catholic Rome. And the monastic practices of Wales up to this point were very much frowned upon. This was dealt with, and the four dioceses were created, that you see there playing in red on this map, and two of the old bishop houses, the great bishop houses of Wales, were suppressed. The great bishop house of Llanbadal, of St. Padarn, and of Llandelo, of St. Taylor. And both of these suppressed houses, the other ones, the five great bishop houses, uh, the other three were actually absorbed and became diocesan centres. It's very, it looks very particular that de Haybarth's relationship with the diocesan church is expunged by this process. Uh, those are, the, in grey, the two suppressed. They became, eventually, uh, parochial, collegiate first and then parochial. So, again, a question. Was the creation of Strata Florida actually an attempt to fill the void of having no diocesan centre in Teresa's areas of power? and to replace or recall the older pre-Norman church by recruiting the Cistercians. In other words, they couldn't go, they couldn't go back, as it says there. Uh, St. Neither St. Ilo's church nor St. Padden's church could be revived in situ uh, since the Norman uh, diocesan church had reduced them to parochial. They couldn't go back on that decision. They couldn't refound uh, those two uh, bishop houses. Effectively, the question then again comes back to, was Fries creating a state church for an aspirant state of the Haybarth, or even Wales? One indicator of this intention may be the reputation that Strata Florida gained very quickly, probably transferred from Llanbadarn, from for the production of Welsh texts in the Welsh language, histories, myths, poetry, and religious texts and legal codes. As many of you here know, 
it's very difficult to, to, to say precisely where a manuscript came from. But if you look at the great scholars of the Welsh manuscript, time and time and time again, Strata Flora is seen as the production not just of manuscripts which are extant, most of which are in the National Library of Wales, but actually the contents as, as well, the drawing together of the, uh, of the, hist of the material which form the Mabinogion, for example, uh, is reputed to have been done at Strata Flora. From Fries's point of view, in a sense, in, in terms of needing uh, a, a state church, this is a body of skilled intellectuals and administrators who can operate in the medium of Welsh culture, not just in language uh, itself. The project seems to be to encode, to inscript, and to preserve a Welsh culture in the Welsh language, and the manuscripts we have are a great triumph in relationship to that, and always associated with Strata Florida. Was there also external recognition of this ambition? Um, in 1212, King John ordered the abbey, which harbours our enemies, to be destroyed. That's really quite an exceptional thing uh, to do. In 1238, just before his death, Llewellyn Barr brought all the princes of Wales to Strata Florida to swear allegiance to his son David, portrayed in the, in the manuscript there on his deathbed, as his sole heir. Transfer of power from one person to another, intact, territorially, as well as legally, is the essential prerequisite of a feudal state. He brought them all to Strata Florida. The question I have is, why didn't he go to his diocesan centre at Bangor? Why did he not go to one of his own Cistercian abbeys in the north? My feeling is that this place has already recruited a meaning, as meaningful in terms of that kind of Welsh identity that Llewellyn Bauer is explicitly using. In the two, the, the, you, see the, you can see, you know, there should be a swastika at the top of that um, black line for the 1282-83 uh, campaign. You see, what I, see what I mean? Um, I, I gave, once gave a lecture, sorry, I'm not supposed to digress, but I once gave, 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 gave a lecture, and uh, the, pers the person at the audience thought that this was going to be the new railway line that united <laughs> the whole of Wales. <laughs> Because as many of you, you know, if you want to hold a meeting of all the Welsh archaeologists, you go to Shrewsbury, <laughs> of, of all places. Um, anyway, uh, you can see, uh, and it is very explicit, you, you, you read the chronicles, uh, and, and that's what they do. And then in 1284, the church was burnt. The annals say, accidentally. I think it's a bit like Steve Biko slipping on a block of, uh, a block of soap. Uh, I don't think there was anything deliberate about it at all. Oh, sorry. One other and important aspect of this. In 1402-1407, on three separate occasions, there's an article just about to come out uh, on this in Welsh History Review, Strata Flora was occupied by an English force pursuing Owain Glyndwr, the last proclaimed, self-proclaimed Welsh prince. It was effectively desecrated and destroyed. The English stabled their horses in the church and the building was burnt to the ground after the horses were taken out, if any of you are worried about that. So that was the, this is the historical context for the Strata Florida project. Uh, we've conducted phase one, 2004 to 2015, um, largely uh, in, in, in terms of the research in, by the, uh, my university. We are now pausing to write up and produce the volume on this. It has two principal elements, research, and I had two research questions. How extensive was the Abbey and its historic landscapes? And how well does our archaeology survive? Well, the answer to those two questions is big, very, very big, and very well, thank you very much, as you can see from the excavation photograph there of the great gatehouse of uh, the Abbey. We're also conducting, however, as some of you know, heritage regeneration on the site. We want to purchase, conserve, and sustainably develop the Manaklog Var group of listed buildings, the house itself, uh, there, I'm not going to talk about it this evening, uh, is uh, a great two-star listed building and is, is a gentry house of the Stedman family and it was built out of the refectory, there was fabric there, of the refectory of the abbey from the late 12th century inside of it. And we want to do all of this with, with a knowledge and understanding of those ancient landscapes. The context indeed for the, well, the project is the extensive landscape and the estate granted to Strata Florida by Fries and his sons in the last two decades of the 12th century. And this map, again playing in green, gives you some sense of the lands which were granted uh, by uh, the house of uh, the Hebart 
It is huge. If anybody knows some of these places that are there on the map, uh, from Aberystwyth to Rheida, uh, you, you have lands uh, of Strata Florida. It is vast. Uh, to give you some sense of its contemporary meaning, I have put into uh, orange there also the sister house, also founded from Whitland, of Abbey Coombe here and the grant of its lands. Look at the foot, compare the two footprints of the two. Abbey Coombe here is the more normal grant. Now, something is clearly going on here. Why such an enormous and massive grant? This is not, as you will see in a moment, good agricultural land. A lot of it is mountain upland. But it is still vast and extensive, with an enormous footprint right over the centre of Wales. Strata Florida is at the upper end of the Toby Valley. Uh, it's a topography of upland and glaciated valley floors, particularly the Tavy Valley, a broad glaciated valley, which widens out, particularly as you travel south from course uh, Cavern in there. The upland stretches up, and I'm going to use old money here, to 1,700 feet. Uh, the bottom of the valleys are around about 600 feet. Um, and the, the, the greatest of the mountain area lies to the east, the Cambrian Mountains, which is the central spine of, uh, of mid and south uh, Wales. Uh, right in the heart of it lies uh, Cos Caron, uh, of that uh, in a moment, uh, and other Gors areas. Gors is heathland, moorland, uh, in this particular case, wetland moors in, in, in particular. Um, and at the heart of the landscape is, is Cors Caron, uh, looking northwards towards the Manus Bach. It's a National Rakes Reserve, it's a Ramsar site, it's internationally known and renowned. And Strata Florida owned, I think, all of it. Now, uh, one of the projects that has greatly influenced me uh, in, in this is the Barlings project in Lincolnshire, and the work done by Paul Everson and David Stockham. Paul is here this evening. Thank you very much for, for coming, Paul. Um, and I'm very much influenced by what it is they say and its relationship with the sacred landscapes of Bog. Now, I'm not going to say anything about the sacred landscape of the Bog here, but I do think it exists. It's just that I haven't, a, in a sense, much empirical evidence to back that statement up. Prior to Strata Florida owning it, it seems to have been divided up into small patches by a whole vast range of, of, of communities. Of course, Caron also famously has been a source of palynological study since the 1940s, and arguably palynology was invented uh, at, in these huge, deep deposits of peat uh, at uh, Cors Caron. It's complex. Recently, this upper parts were looked at by Elizabeth Morris, and again, I, you know, I, this, is a, this, is, this is complicated, but it does give a sequence, um, and I will just very quickly uh, summarise that. Uh, in the late Iron Age, early Roman period, up to about the end of the first century uh, AD, we are in an arable optimum. There's a lot of arable around, we have a lot of farmsteads and so on. Then there's a beginning of a massive agrarian decline, beginning in the second to fifth centuries. Uh, you have huge regeneration, you have loss of arable, you have indeed loss of, of good pasture land as well in the indicators. And that agrarian decline really continues until the late 8th, early 9th century. And then in the 9th century, as you get the rise of the Welsh federal kings, you begin the processes of recovery. Not very well developed by the time we get to the 12th century and the moment we want uh, to look at in particular. One of the things that was noted right from the beginning of work on the Strata Florida sequence, particularly by Judith Turner, who famously wrote the great article on anthropogenic factors uh, on landscape, um, is the fact that the, the footprint, the arrival of Strata Florida is easily detectable. Massive rise in arable production, massive rise in improved pasture, and a pushing back of the scrubland that had regenerated. Now, this map is even worse in terms of the complexity of it. And in a way, I just want to show you that the, what we're doing is, is an immense study of the landscapes of Strata Florida. And we can't just look at physical topography, we've got to look at cultural topography. Now, the colours uh, are slightly merged 
uh, in this, and I apologise for that. But the four cultural elements are the mountain tops, the open pastures, the manas. Manas in, in Welsh is a cultural word, not, not necessarily a physical geography word. Slopes and mountain valleys, the fries, this is land which could be uh, extended and occupied. Uh, and then a heartland, a tirkartlan, the heartlands on the good land of the valley floor. And the point about this, and I'll try and use the mouse to, to show you, it's actually between the mountain and the bog, it's a very narrow ring of land in little niches tucked into the mountain, as well as on some ridges, glacial moraine largely, which penetrates out into the bog uh, itself. Um, this is an example of one of those niches. It's Maestreflin, it's named in the chart of 1184, and it's a niche between Pentlanech and Koshkaron, mentioned in the bounds, and you can actually still detect them on the maps. You might notice that I am using the, the first edition six inch map as a base here. One of the real surprises I had when I went into Wales, you use the 19th century mapping, you're actually, if you decode it a bit, you're actually using a medieval map. It's really quite extraordinary in, in, in these areas. And you can see, uh, Mice Trevelin is this little piece of land that sticks its tongue out into Kosh Caron. It has a glacial lake next to it, hence the name of the place. Maestrin means the field of the lake. And Trevelin uh, is a little niche up a little side valley where a glacier has hollowed out a little bit uh, of a, an area that is good arable land. In 1165, Fries Sakrev confirmed the small initial grant of Robert Fitzstephen, as we've seen, of certain places in his lordship of Penarth. We can identify seven of the ten uh, in relationship to this map, and they are on the niches, on these good, on this good, he's only granting the good land. Whether or not at this time it's the only land in a sense that was available to be granted, I don't know yet. But it's an interesting possibility. And the first site of Strata Florida was founded at a site which is quite useful and convenient. Welsh place names are brilliant, telling you what's going on in the landscape. Hen Rachlog, which means the old monastery. Okay, it's quite straightforward. Old monastery, Hen Rachlog. Now, I use this word refoundation. Again, it probably needs a lot of justification, which we will do in print. And I think there's a new ambition. I think at the height of his powers, around about 1184, Fries makes this second massive grant and a decision was taken to move the site of the abbey. And that decision is quite important in what I want to say uh, as I close this uh, lecture. Um, all the things in red are lands in the charters which are uh, mentioned as being on, and this is quite important, uh, in places Nomina locorum excellentiorum, the names of the places that were more excellent. Now it could be of the more excellent people, but it's usually translated the more excellent places. And I think that describes the niche lands. I think specifically in the charter, that's what it is they're saying. Strata Florida doesn't, I think, create granges. I think that comes much later. Strata Florida creates a domain of specialist farms, very much on the Carolingian model, Cow, uh, uh, a pig farm, an orchard, and a specialist uh, woodland, and so on, to sustain the needs of uh, the abbey, effectively a manor. Um, the Granges, which we have in 16th century documents, appear to be a later creation. We can discuss that. The new strata Florida is placed in a small east-west valley. Um, it's in the bottom centre of the photograph. There, this is looking eastwards, uh, looking westwards. And you can see in the, in, in the haze in the distance, the Irish Sea. That gives you a very strong connection. This site tilts towards Ireland. And there's at least one person in the audience who would want me to lecture entirely on, on this. But um, it's uh, something I can answer questions on, on later. It has the bog to the west, and I think that's significant, and the mountains to the east. If I was an all-out um, phenomenologist, uh, of the Chris Tilly kind, which I am not, um, although I am theoretically interested, okay, let me put it that way, um, I, I would say it's coming from the dark black bog westwards up 
to the mountain. This is the journey of life, pilgrim's journey. I'm not going to give you a long account of what we've discovered in the archaeology. These things are often tedious and um, this is the stuff that deserves and will be in print. One of the extraordinary things to go now alongside of the fact that there is this huge grant of land is that the abbey has a precinct area of 126 acres. In this august company, I hesitate to say that you can put the plan of fountains inside of Strata Florida. And it has, unlike many, most Cistercian abbeys, instead of compact building complexes, it has large interior spaces. And John Leland, I'll make a point of this as well, called it the great court for the abbey. One of the three or four distinctive things he noted about Strata Florida. Um, and there are uh, extensive surviving landscape features of specialist production all around this abbey site. It's a fabulously rich archaeological site. I want to touch then on sacred landscape, which is going to be the main theme of this last, last 10 minutes, is the start with where you would start, where indeed uh, an architectural historian would start, where many of the people who talk about the sacred spaces, the extensive literature on the sacred spaces, all of which I think are limited to the core buildings, the core monastic buildings. At Strata Florida, this extraordinary west door um, which, I suppose in architectural terms, belongs in a kind of Romanesque, Gothic, transitional world. Um, the key thing about it, really, is that it has labels around the outside of it, uh, which are referential to Celtic art. This is the art that you will find on the carved stones and monuments of an earlier period. And they're quite deliberate. Go inside the church, we have hundreds and hundreds of pieces uh, of the surviving architectural sculpture of Strada Florida, and it's Gothic. It's all early Gothic. It's only at the door, the moment of entry, the liminal point, is this statement, this under those who have eyes to see will know what it is they are passing through. And at the other end, at the end of the high altar in the burial ground, Celtic art appears again. So this is this artistic sandwich between Celtic art, of Celtic art providing the bread and the Gothic providing the Marmite in the middle. You might like Marmite, I don't. A feature, and I really want to focus on this now, this, this is the nub of the story, right? A feature previously disregarded, and it is still unmentioned in the guidebook, sits right at the crossing of the church. It consists of a hole in the ground, stone line, with steps going down one side from the west and down the other side from the east. At the centre of the, the, where the two steps meet, there's a system into which water can flow and flow out. And uh, for me, this is very, very important. Its non-appearance to the guidebook, I think, is absolutely extraordinary. Whenever I took students there, or took visitors around, in the long years before I undertook the start of Florida Project, I was always asked what this was. I had no answer whatsoever. Everybody assumed it was baptism. And I kind of shook my head and said, hmm, I didn't do baptism in the uh, sanctuary of a, uh, of a, of a, of a Cistercian uh, abbey. If it's going to be anyway, it's going to be down the far west end. Uh, is it a mandatum? Is it about the ceremony of the washing of the feet? I've asked all over Europe whether anyone has ever seen a mandatum that looks like this, and the answer is no. Um, when it was first excavated, I believe, and I was told this by Academy Inspector many years ago, no names, no pack drill, it was an inspection cover for the drainage system <laughs> of Strata Florida. Not least because there's a kind of, you can see this ledge around the outside, which is clearly to let a trapdoor, a wooden trapdoor, up onto the top so that the thing can be opened. Another thing about it is, uh, it's not terribly clear in my photographs there, but I've got an air photograph that will show it in a moment. It's on a different alignment from the church. The church, we now know, is aligned westwards 
on sunset in the week of St David's Day. This site is aligned due east-west. Um, and it has enclosing walls. Now these are usually said to be late. You look at the sequence on there, they're said to be late. Well actually there's no reason hmm, why they should be thought of as late. They simply butt up to the, butt, to the, the main piers <laughs> of the tower. I think they're primary. There's some other curiosities as well. That odd alignment, there is a blue, you see a blue north-south line running through the chapter house. I should say north-south north, is left to, left to right on, on, on this picture, not uh, up. You know. That blue line there, which is again said to be secondary inside the chapter house, is on the same alignment as this feature. All right. I've given it away by my caption, I realise. It's a holy well, I think. And I, it has all the architecture of a holy well. Two sets of steps, a cistern, a basin, water flowing in and out of it. And it's before the high altar of the abbey within an enclosed space. And I thought, uh, what the dickens is this? Stephen Williams, when he excavated the site in the 19th century, which really cleared the site, the footprint that's run by Caddo is pretty much the Stephen Williams excavation. Nothing there. Rory Radford did the clearance excavations. Now, if any of you are familiar, please, with Rory Radford's work, would you please tell me, I know there's some of his notes in Exeter, but I don't know whether the antiquaries, I haven't actually had time to look yet. Uh, there is no report of these excavations whatsoever. It wasn't unusual in those days, of course. I'm not trying to blame him for anything. It was it's what, it's what you did. The interesting thing from my point of view is that his first guidebook in 1936, it's not there. And then in 1946, it's there. It's uncommented on, it's unmentioned, it's not in the text. It's not in the text of the guidebook still, which is really quite extraordinary. And I think... He just couldn't explain it. I think it was as simple as that. And until very, very recently, and this came after I'd agreed to give the lecture at the Antiquaries, um, and uh, fortune sometimes smiles on you, an excavation was drawn to my, my attention, done several years, a few years ago now, at, a, at an abbey, a Benedictine abbey in Finisterre, in Brittany, uh, Lond de Venec, uh, and this revealed under the Benedictine Abbey, as modelled here uh, on the two left-hand side, one is a blow-up of, of the other, a holy well with a system before the high altar, and interestingly and importantly from our point of view, the shrine of the saint, Sanguinole, behind, just behind uh, that, uh, it's that, that, that holy well. The young excavators of the site at Finisterre said this. Uh, Welsh uh, Welsh. French architectural historians poo-pooed this and said, this, this cannot be the case, there's no parallel for it. They were so delighted when we got in contact and said, we got one. Uh, was a, uh, so there are two, two sets of people, at least, who are standing and saying, this is very interesting. The interesting thing about, the final interesting thing about Lond of Enic is that the Benedictine Abbey, which is completely rebuilt, is rebuilt around the shrine and around the holy well inside of the church. There is one legendary artifact that is associated with Strata Florida and its traditions of water, holy water, and healing, because I believe that holy well is about healing. The Nantios Cup, the famous Nantios Cup. I'm simply going to ask now, is it too much to think that this legendary cup, from which if you drank the water, you would get instant healing, a belief that still exists, uh, was it once used to take water from the Holy Well Shrine at the heart of the Abbey? It is reputedly, I've never handled it, it is reputedly uh, a Mazer Cup, a standard Mazer Cup that you would find in the refectory of an abbey such as Strata Florida. Let's look at the well in a wider setting. There it is at the crossing of the church and the water management system that feeds into it is clearly plumbed into the water system 
of the Abbey comes out of a little valley to the south called Dufferin Tower. The river, the Avon Glass Frood, is in an artificial channel, as you might expect the Cistercians to do to stop the valley flooding, simple functional point. But they do an arrangement of uh, the waters, uh, and it includes another holy well. This is it. This is a blow-up of Dufferin Tower. This is the water management system as we have it. And there's a holy well. It is, was created by cutting back a vertical face of rock. The system is inserted into the, that vertical face of rock. You see one of my former students looking at it there. Uh, and there are two steps, sets of steps, coming down to the holy well. One to the system itself and one to the base where you have the pond uh, for uh, the holy well. The water of the holy well there is fed into the water system of the abbey and therefore the water of the abbey is sanctified, if you believe in such things, by the waters of the holy well. Also, there is the interesting thing about the cemetery. Um, if you look, and this really occurred to me very recently, if you look at the church, uh, you could say that the cemetery was post-dissolution and it accumulated and grew around uh, the abbey uh, itself, the dissolved abbey itself. Well, I don't think that's the case. I think it's the other way around. I think the church has been dropped over the top of the cemetery and in order to capture the holy well, which would have been on one side on the south side of that cemetery. This is it. You can see the plan. We don't know the full extent of that cemetery. But we do know that it has at least one 10th century stone that has come from it. I've stood Nancy Edwards in front of it to make sure that it's 10th century, as far as we can possibly establish. Uh, it is 10th, she says it's 10th century. It's 10th century, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but the other thing also, I go back to John Leland, is he says, the cemetery wherein the country about doth bury is very large. It's a huge burial ground. There's an enormous sentiment to be buried at Strata, Florida. There are a lot of the London Welsh who are returned as corpses to Strata, Florida, to be buried at Strata, Florida itself. Hiraith, this notion of return and journey. Um, we've got complex geophysics. I'm not going to try and unpack that yet. Um, there's, you can see the, the, the church complex in, in, in the middle of it. We need much more geophysics, and I'm sure we'll make an application to the antiquaries in due course for uh, some assistance in relationship uh, to that. No pressure. There's, I don't want a decision now today. Um, but the, uh, the, it is hugely complex. It's revealed where the, a lot of the stone buildings are and, and so on. Um, but one of the things that it has done is identify the clear fact now that there is a huge amount of pre-Cistercian activity on the site, some of which is related to a sequence of ditches uh, which we've located on the western side, and the focus of that high density of activity is clearly uh, on an arc which starts to identify that the cemetery, this pre-Cistercian cemetery, with its early stone in it, and the Holy Well, lie at the centre of what might be a pre-Cistercian monastery. Got a long way to go yet. This is only the end of phase one, remember. Calls to my mind the conceptual map of an early monastery from the Book of Mulling, which you as scholars, I'm sure, will know. One of the things I'm really interested in the Book of Mulling depiction is those crosses. They fascinated scholars for many, many de decades. Many of them lie outside the rings of the monastic complex itself. Excavation of the Great West Gate, which is the, the biggest excavation that we've done, shows uh, that we've got two of these ditches, these early ditches. Stratigraphically, unequivocally, they're pre cistercian They lie under the buildings. Indeed, however, they were lay open and visible when the Cistercian gatehouse was laid out at the end of the 12th century because they had to build into the ditch to shore up the corners to make sure that they were properly and fully supported. And there's one on this corner, and there's one on the opposing and opposite corner. And from the third corner here, and I saw this on just a, sun, a sunlit day, uh, so I just threw my watch at it as a scale, that watch. 
through my watch it as a scale, there are these low orthostats which are on the same alignment as those pre-Cistercian ditches and have been incorporated into the plan uh, of the Great Gate. There is a parallel for this out in uh, the landscape. Uh, these are uh, something that's called locally the monk's graves. And I went to the Royal Commission to get the record on this. There is no record of this in the Royal Commission at all. It's never been drawn to their attention, which I found most curious. The local people took me to this. It's a line of stones, low stones, marked with crosses, equal arm crosses, and they point to a certain location in the landscape. Another holy well. And this is the glass food well, which appears to lie at the centre of all of this. Basin, steps, it even has veneration objects going back a couple of hundred years around it. As you can see, it was enclosed in forestry, is now revealed, and you're looking up to the source of the Avon glass fruit in the, uh, on the ridge, the, in fact, it's the watershed of the Cambrian Mountains uh, in the east. That location, I think, is itself utterly remarkable. And uh, what you have, these are the, the headwaters there in blue of the Avon glass fruit. The monuments that you're seeing depicted in the top left-hand corner, there are about 24 of them. They are, consist of cairns, quite large cairns, uh, Kistvein in many of them, uh, and st st at least one standing stone and one really rather curious structure in amongst all of this. It's certainly not many, there are many more things there. One of the things I really found interesting is that because of the nature of survival, uh, there are trackways and pathways between these monuments, some of which lead to the monuments themselves, and at least two lead to one of the source waters of the Avon glass fruit. The ridge, this is where place names became become useful, above it is called Eskaerlindi, which means the ridge of the Black Lake. There is a bog uh, in its flush next to these monuments, and these monuments at the bottom left-hand corner, you can't really make that out unless you know the site. That's the bog in the centre there. It's hunkered down in a hollow. All the other monuments, as depicted on this map, <coughs> of similar date and similar class, are all on the ridge tops. This site is unique, regionally. But its association with water, that far back, um, heartened by the work of people like Geoffrey Wainwright and, uh, and, and, and Tim, um, Tim Darville on the Procellids, which are identifying lots of these kind of sites which look at spring waters and sources. So, this is the Glass Fruit Valley. It has this complex of prehistoric monuments at the bottom. It has four holy wells along its line. There may be more, we don't know yet. At least one of which is picked out and identified by Christian iconography, pointed at by Christian iconography and one of which at the lower end is captured and used and embraced by the Abbey Church itself. I think, in a sense, there is a shrine at Strata Florida that draws, that drew in the oral tradition. This is the Avon glass fruit looking up from the Abbey in, in, in the bottom. Um, I think is what draws people there. Lots of conclusions about this. The principal one that I want to lay before you this evening, it has a hint of a question inside of it, because phase two, I think, has got to be directed at understanding this even further, is that I think that the Lord Rees and the Cistercians knew about the sacredness of this site. They wished to recruit it. They wished, in a sense, to embrace its Celtic identity and, and descent, and they went about it and designed conscious way, in a way they kind of lurked for 20 years in Hinnachlog before they took the decision then to move to this location. It is careful. There are all sorts of things I can tell you about that I can't this evening. All sorts of careful precisions about the way the Abbey is placed into this pre-existing uh, landscape. And I think it's deliberate. I think it's about the Lord Rees trying to make Strata Florida in a sense, meld in and be part of the long tradition. 
the long tradition of Wales, to enhance his power as a Welsh prince, but to use the Cistercians as the world order, the right order of Christendom, in a sense, to show that he was a true prince of Western Europe. So Don's Hiraith, I feel, has ancient roots, embedded in a sacred landscape and in a place where the process of enshrining the written Welsh language at the core of a national identity, with the conscious of intention of creating an independent Welsh state. He could not then have known what you and I have just heard, but I hope I have added some substance to his emotions on the threshold of death. Thank you very much indeed.